Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Buttle Finlay, we are delighted and proud to have the opportunity to sponsor today's regulatory session and to introduce the first speaker of that session, Karen Silk, Assistant Governor, General Manager Economics, Financial Markets and Banking at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Karen is, of course, well known and her background will be familiar to most of you, I'm sure. Having held a number of senior management and executive roles with Westpac New Zealand, and before that, Westpac Australia, as well as being a director of Paymark, prior to joining the Reserve Bank earlier this year. She has also been a board member of the New Zealand Sustainable Business Council since 2017 and was appointed its chair in 2019. Karen also co-chaired the Sustainable Finance Forum on behalf of the Aotearoa Circle, a joint business and government initiative which publicly released its roadmap for action in 2020. Karen will be sharing a regulator's view of the changing payments landscape in New Zealand and the potential responses to it. It promises to be a thought-provoking and forward-looking presentation, taking a broader view of that landscape through the lens of a central bank, not only in relation to the Reserve Bank's role as a regulator and supervisor, but also as steward of money and cash in the context of the wider monetary system. That, in turn, engages a range of issues going forward which are of particular importance in relation to the future of money, uh, including the redesign of the cash system in the face of changing patterns of use, and the embracing of digital innovation in money and payments, including the use case for CBDCs, all while maintaining accessibility, uh, I would also say trust, given the last presentation we've just watched, and ensuring the retention of monetary sovereignty. The challenge of successfully addressing those issues, I'd say, is expected to require greater alignment leadership and collaboration across industry participants and regulators. That, among other topics, is quite a lot to cover in the space of a quarter of an hour. So without any further delay, I would uh, ask if you could please join with me in welcoming, welcoming Karen to the stage. Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thanks, Scott, and thank you Payments New Zealand uh, for inviting me to speak today. Look, at six months into my role, I think this is possibly the last time I can claim to be a recent joiner at Te Pitea Matua, uh, where it's my privilege to be an assistant governor. Uh, in my career, career to date, I have spent significantly greater time in the commercial sector being regulated, uh, but I'm enjoying the opportunity to stand back, reassess many of the familiar issues uh, from new perspectives, and in particular, giving thought to how these may impact the prosperity and well-being of all New Zealanders. Um, as Scott uh, suggested just uh, in a couple of minutes ago, my focus today will be on some of the challenges we see impacting New Zealanders' ability to benefit from reliable and efficient, so I think that was the capability side that Rachel talked about, uh, money and payment systems, but also ones that support innovation and inclusion. And the work at the Reserve Bank to directly address or support others in overcoming these challenges. Um, my overarching message is that we're all working and living in a period of substantive change. It's one that offers enormous opportunity if embraced and potentially greater risk if not. So payments are the ebb and flow of money. Increasing attention is being given to both the global evolution in payment and money forms to which New Zealand is not immune, and to our increasing demand for better, smarter, faster forms of payments. It's not only the realm of advanced economies. So I've had the pleasure of spending a week in Washington recently um, talking with central bank governors from around the world, and um, emerging economies are absolutely embracing new technology. They're doing it uh, to support greater financial accessibility and inclusion, and in some cases, they are absolutely leapfrogging those more advanced, still clinging to aged infrastructure and payment practices. Without greater ambition uh, and innovation, New Zealand will not fully avail itself of the opportunity that technological change is creating. Uh, the Reserve Bank's role is a multifaceted one. First, we operate, regulate, and supervise core payment systems. And secondly, as the steward of money and cash, our responsibilities lie not only in the issuance of central bank money, but also the role that it performs. 
So the first of these roles is as a value anchor for private money, versions of which are the products and lifeblood of the people in this room, for the financial system and for the economy more generally. Central bank money is a value anchor because people trust its value and can convert it at par to private money. Physical cash, as both a concept and a choice, plays a very important role in this regard. With central bank money as a value anchor, we can use monetary policy to meet the objectives under our remit of maintaining price stability and supporting maximum sustainable employment. This in, turns, in turn enables retention of our monetary sovereignty. It allows us to operate monetary policy in a way that makes sense in the context for the New Zealand economy, rather than merely importing monetary policy decisions from other economies. The second role of central bank money, particularly physical cash, is the contribution it still makes to inclusion and wellbeing across society as an accessible form of payment. Our responses to our Future of Money Stewardship Issues paper uh, released in 2021 had, and the ongoing research that we're doing are reaffirming that New Zealanders actually still value cash, even among the many of us that don't use it on a regular basis. Many regard cash as the most dependable form of money, particularly in times of crisis, a natural disaster, or even less traumatic system outages, something that many in this room are well aware of. Cash provides choice, autonomy, and agency for all, and for some, it is the only form of money they can have or use. Cash today still forms a critical part also of social and cultural exchange. So koha, social club raffles, for those of you with children, even the tooth fairy. However, the commercial case for maintaining cash services in today's primary channels for distribution, bank branches and ATMs, is weakened as a consequence of its declining use for basic transactions. As a consequence, the cash system arrangements aren't as efficient as they could be, and I think some could argue they're even in a critical state. The system today lacks resilience, cash handling firms are maintaining costly infrastructure to enable distribution to all corners of the country, despite a shrinking platform for distribution and declining use. Many submitters to the 2021 Future of Money Cash System Redesign paper had the view that cash access accessibility needs to improve. It's also consistent with the feedback uh, received under the earlier Future of Cash work in 2017. This uh, feedback and the information that the Reserve Bank continues to gather on this issue uh, points to value in further exploring the potential net ben benefits of options that support other parties, in particular merchants, having an expanded role in cash dis distribution, augmenting the current commercial bank-centric cash system. Now, augmentation could include supporting merchants to recycle cash at point of sale, remunerating them for cash-out services, facilitating frequent uh, affordable cash delivery and collection for merchants, or it could be the, and or it could be the consolidation within the cash system with the creation of utility entities. These options could improve resilience by changing incentives and commercial realities facing key cash system participants today. Look, it's important, however, that we actually understand the impacts of any of those options before we implement them. And so we plan to explore them with a series of small live experiments through 2023. The Reserve Bank remains committed to ensuring cash as one form of central bank money is available to New Zealanders for as long as people value and use it. We're concerned about the wellbeing and inclusion impacts for those that depend on cash to pay and save, yet no longer have free or easy access to it. And we're, we're therefore looking for alternatives to bolster that. 
I'll now um, move on to uh, a more relevant topic for many of you here in the room, and that's the innovation in digital payments. So, as you all know uh, very clearly in this room, once fully implemented, open banking has the potential to support innovation and inclusion by opening up consented access to both existing payment capabilities and to the customer's financial data. Whilst digital innovation is beginning to occur both on top of and in competition with traditional payment rails, we do not have in this country scalable digitised instant peer-to-peer -peer payments, and our lack of real-time systems for payments positions us as an outlier amongst OECD countries. The slow pace of implementing promising developments is an issue for our economy. We could become more digitally competitive, including by nurturing our own homegrown fintechs, and as a society, we may see significant benefit through increased domestic competition and efficient savings, both directly in payments and across the wider financial system. We can all do better. Lingering reliance on legacy systems, failure to understand regula uh, regulator impetus and focus, and limitations in the coordination and the provision of regulatory support for innovation are inhibiting real progress and the broader benefits for New Zealand. So, uh, while the expansion of payment forms and providers can bring significant benefits, it can also pose a number of new challenges. New and existing providers may unwittingly introduce risks into the money and payment system through flawed product design or implementation of new technology. Providers may also sit outside of current regulation by virtue of geography or perhaps by attempts to keep themselves out of regulatory perimeter to maximise their competitive edge. And as these new digital means displace the use of publicly issued notes and coins, central bank money, they could put at risk the core values of central bank money as a trusted and stable value anchor and the contribution that makes to a stable economy supporting wellbeing and inclusion for all. In recognition of the burgeoning scale of the payments industry here in New Zealand, uh, regulators are becoming increasingly fo focused on payments, which won't be lost on any of you. It's not only to ensure their reliability and efficiency, but also to ensure that conditions exist to support innovation and inclusion while protecting economic and social good. Our regulatory frameworks as a con consequence are starting to be enhanced. So the Financial Markets Infrastructure Act created a comprehensive regulatory designation regime covering key systemically important payment infrastructure. The updated RBNZ Act has refreshed our role, structure and payments mandate. The Retail Payments System Act has given the Commerce Commission the mandate to regulate the retail payment systems and its participants, including merchants, banks, non-bank merchant acquirers and card schemes. And the upcoming consumer data right, when it comes, uh, is anticipated to strengthen and support New Zealand's open banking regime. So regulators are also cooperating with one another and coordinating their respective payments regulatory activities. The Council of Financial Regulators, now with statutory status, is an active forum for exchanging information on new business models and identifying any regulatory gaps. Also through its digital and innovation working group, it's now starting to offer support for fintechs seeking guidance on the state of New Zealand regulation and its application to them. At the Reserve Bank, as we take forward our own Future of Money and Payments Work Programme, we've developed an objective which is going to be our guiding star for what good looks like. And shaping our, how our work contributes to it. And our objective is that New Zealand has reliable and efficient money and payment systems that support innovation and inclusion. So trying to catch a capability and character, as Rachel described it. This objective's reference to both money and payments together in the same statement is deliberate. 
Money and payments have always been intertwined, but digitisation trends make it even more important to view them together. This objective is a system objective. It's not something we can do on our own. Achievement of the outcomes relies on the buy-in and collective effort of the industry, regulators, government, all working together. For our part, we are looking closely at the role that both the forms of central bank money and central bank exchange settlement systems can play in supporting that objective. Our current work on payments systems focuses on enhancing those we operate today to better support industry initiatives aimed at delivering greater efficiencies. So working with ESAS settlement account holders and Payments New Zealand to upgrade our system to meet the now, I believe, March 2023 ISO messages for uh, cross-border payments and supporting Payments New Zealand's SBI uh, 365, which will enable New Zealanders to make and receive value payments on every day of the year. Today, we'll also publish a primer on the payment landscape in New Zealand, describing current arrangements and roles. Purpose of doing this is to give us all a clear and common starting position from which to work on shaping the future of money and payments here in New Zealand. Also, uh, as part of the evolution of the payments landscape, more industry participants are seeking direct access to clearing and settlement systems, including those operated by ourselves. The primary purpose of the exchange settlement system operated by the Reserve Bank is to, to support implementation of monetary policy and to make the financial system as a whole more robust by reducing interbank and trade settlement risk. We're conscious that undue restrictions to access may stifle healthy competition, impair market efficiency, and limit cash system innovation. But we're also cognizant of the need to ensure that the robustness and financial integrity is maintained to ensure that there is trust underpinning the payment system. We're reviewing the extent to which existing access criteria remain fit for purpose, noting all of those points, uh, with completion of the review expected in early 2023. As you'll also be aware, we're also exploring how a central bank digital currency may support the role and use of central bank money in the digital age. We've embarked on the second stage of our exploration. In this phase, we're expanding beyond the desktop research to explore various aspects of design. We're undertaking thematic research on how a digital currency might support wider digital financial inclusion and also enable an open, innovative and competitive payments ecosystem whilst maintaining user privacy. Alongside our thematic research, we'll be undertaking proof of concept uh, experiments starting in 2023 to better understand what is actually feasible. We will continue to work with and engage with stakeholders across the payment system, society, to share learnings and seek feedback on concepts as they are developed. And finally, I'd like to um, briefly address crypto assets. So technology-driven innovation and new forms of private money may deliver instruments more efficiently and at a lower cost. They could serve niche use cases that are not commercially viable nor strategic fits for banks. Regulators, however, are also cognizant of potentially significant risks to consumers arriving from some of this innovation. And that gaps exist today in regulatory toolkits to address these. It's important that new forms of money or payments, whatever their size, reinforce trust in our money, neither reduce competition nor the reliability and efficiency of our money and payment systems, and don't undermine monetary sovereignty. So the time's right for regulators to ask what, if any, additional powers are needed to appropriately balance risk and opportunity, and to provide regulatory certainty that supports beneficial innovation. 
It's also important for us to understand how we can better understand and address some of the cross-cutting challenges that exist today of existing regulation, such as AML, CFT, issues, uh, looking at those issues in a much more consistent and holistic manner. We will issue a, a publish an issues paper on private innovation in money early next month. We're seeking feedback on the content to that by March 23. We sincerely hope that, we, uh, that you take the time to read the paper. We want to hear your views and um, understand how we collectively best support both opportunity and risk in this emerging area. So um, I've tried to cover a lot of ground in the last 15 minutes. Um, there's expanded content uh, on the published version of this speech now available on our website. It's clear uh, that the pace of change in money and payments um, is only going to continue to escalate. It's important that all market participants step up to meet the challenges and opportunities that global, the global evolution of money and payments can offer to improve the well-being and prosperity of all New Zealanders. We recognise there's significant upside for New Zealand if we embrace change, but also risks if we do not or we're not quick enough about it. Our objective is that New Zealand has a reliable, efficient money and payment system that supports innovation and inclusion. And we're looking to all of you in the industry, we're looking to ourselves and to others across the government sector to collaborate to enable that. Collectively, we need to make sure that we do not fall further behind than we already are in advancing our money and payments landscape and that we soundly position ourselves along with New Zealand to benefit from this. Namihi.